Ladies and gentlemen, friends and fellow bibliophiles, today we are gathered in this great enterprise at the behest of our friend and host, Jim Billington, librarian of Congress, scholar extraordinaire, and visionary global cultural leader, pioneer of the American Memory Program, and the founder of the World Digital Library. We are here to discuss the book and its future. And I'm honored to have been asked to launch this process with these reflections. Now, those who have known me well and have had the occasion to attend some of my public lectures would undoubtedly expect me to use hundreds of images to complement and reinforce my talk. But today, I will only use words, for that is a crucial part of the argument that I will make, namely, that the book, as a substantial and significant collection of words, will continue despite the enormous transformations that we are witnessing in all aspects of our modern existence. I'm old enough to remember studying and doing research in libraries at a time when photocopying was a luxury and we used to take laborious notes on index cards. It was a different world without email, faxing, printing or scanning and with very limited wet process photocopying. A world which our youth of 20 years or so would have difficulty imagining or identifying with. The introduction of the mobile phone and the internet a few decades ago was a minor curiosity. Today they are found in the most remote areas of the world as information and communication technologies have transformed our lives. When exactly was the tipping point? Who knows? Who cares? A new reality is here and that is what counts. Will that new reality mark the death of the book as we know it? First, let us say a few words about what I consider the seven characteristics or pillars of this revolution in the very structure of knowledge and how it is constructed and communicated. These are, first, parsing life and organization. Since the beginning of time, whether we were writing on scrolls or on codexes, the accumulation of knowledge was based on parsed structures with units put next to each other like bricks in a wall of an emerging structure. In addition, each piece was dead or fixed. In other words, once published, it stayed exactly as it was until a second edition would appear. Now the internet changed all that. The web page became the unit of parsing and it is constantly updated. Online material becomes alive and interactive. Social connectivity adds to the knowledge connectivity of the semantic web. So the structure, organization and presentation of knowledge will become one large interconnected, vibrant, global living tissue of concepts, ideas and facts no longer parsed like bricks in a wall, it will be more like a smooth, fluid, flowing river. Second, there will be a fluid merging of text and image, both still and video and 3D virtual reality and augmented reality. And third, machines will become essential for humans to search for, find and retrieve and then manipulate knowledge in any field with the exception of pure mathematics and some aspects of philosophy. Now, this is not just good or bad, it just is. Fourth, complexity permeates our world and new analytical tools of science will be required to address that. And here, the fifth pillar, the role of computer sciences will become central as we witness the convergence and transformation of the established sciences which will define the sixth pillar. And seventh, pluridisciplinarity. Many of our real life problems 
such as poverty, gender, or the environment, are multidimensional and need the insights of the social sciences and the wisdom of the humanities in addition to the knowledge of the natural sciences. And here we are at the crux of the issue. For if the natural sciences can survive in the spare and structured formats of journal articles and technical reports, the insights of social science, the power of cultural expression, and the wisdom of the humanities are all denizens of the book. In short, that sweeping knowledge revolution will need the attributes of the book to bring forth its full benefits. But what is much more important, the book is not only critical for the recording, accumulation and transmission of knowledge, it is also indispensable for our enjoyment and crucial in developing and maintaining language, which is the essence of our culture and our identity. Thomas Jefferson once said that he could not imagine living without books. I join him in that sentiment. Further, I join Jorge Luis Borges, who said that he thought paradise would be some kind of library. But what is a book? Let us embark on a brief journey into the history of the book. Although my cousins in what is today Iraq may have been among the first to promote writing on tablets, it was the Egyptians who in the third millennium before our era gave the ancient world the perfect medium for writing, papyrus. A thick paper-like material made by woven stems of the papyrus plant which were pounded into sheets and then glued together to form a scroll. Yes, a scroll. For millennia, the scroll would be the form in which books were kept. My other cousins in what is today Lebanon, ever the traders, were the ones who carried that great Egyptian invention to Europe. And with that came some of the words we associate with the book today. According to Herodotus, the Phoenicians brought writing and papyrus to Greece around the 10th or 9th century BC. The Greek word for papyrus as writing material was biblion and book, biblos. Come both of them from the Phoenician port town of Byblos, through which papyrus was exported to Greece. From Greek we also derive the word tome, which originally meant a slice or a piece from which began to denote a roll of papyrus. Thomas was used by the Latins with exactly the same meaning as volumen. Now throughout late antiquity, scrolls made of different materials such as papyrus or parchment coexisted with the codex. The format of leaves bound on one side, allowing writing on both sides of the leaf and convenient for storage and reading. Isidore of Seville tried to give a functional differentiation to the words codex and scroll by saying that a codex is composed of many books, a book is of one scroll. It is called codex by way of metaphor. But our modern usage differs. And the codex is that form which we associate with the book. Leaves bound on one side, we call the spine, usually protected by a heavier cover. By the 5th century, the Codex was rapidly replacing the scroll throughout the Roman world. But the scroll had had quite a long reign. Scrolls were the dominant form of book in the ancient Egyptian, Persian, Hellenistic and Roman cultures, as well as the Chinese, Hebrew and other ancient cultures. So the Codex replaced the scroll largely out of convenience. It was, as Umberto Eco would say, one of those felicitous inventions or discoveries that once discovered remain unchanged, like the spoon, the hammer, the scissors, or the axe. The book 
as we know it, was perfect. It was convenient to carry, easy to open, and find your way to where you had last stopped. And it was a combination of reading and storage device that delighted the readers and writers for millennia. The Gutenberg invention of the printing press would revolutionize the world. It was to be one of the first efforts at mass production and thus prefigures the Industrial Revolution by substituting printing many copies using machines rather than laboriously copying each book by hand in an artisanal fashion. It also laid the groundwork for a massive expansion in reading just as Europe was getting out of the Dark Ages. The Enlightenment would be its biggest and most important progeny. McLuhan has also observed that printing gave the visual sense an enormous importance over the other senses as a means of gaining and communicating ideas and information. The Codex reigned supreme. The book in its codex form would survive all forms of new technologies. Radio, cinema, television, all were expected at some point to mark the end of reading, the end of newspapers, and the end of books. But all these enormously transformative technologies tended to be additive. We have a lot more information from a lot of different channels, and among these, reading and books flourished. There are many more books today, both in print and being written and issued, than at any previous time in history. There are more readers today than at any previous time in history. And the new technologies have enabled the creation of global virtual book clubs that connect millions of book lovers, such as the goodreads.com site that has connected over 12 million book lovers in a few short years, and who they claim have added more than 400 million books to their bookshelves since joining Goodreads. The service is quite remarkable in its reach and the coverage it brings, fueled by the efforts of over 40,000 volunteer editors and the revenue of some author and publisher advertisements. What then, if anything, should we be concerned about in this enormous transformation that is hitting our world like a tsunami? Well, some of the formats we got used to will change. The production and sales channels will change. But the book will remain the book. Also, there may be some concern about the manner in which language will develop in the coming generation. But first, let us go back to the book. What makes a book a book? Here, I would like to address the book not as a physical object whose shape can change in many ways, but as content, a collection of words of a certain minimum length. So, how long should a book be? Well, today, novels, the most common form of book, can provide a hint of the book's length, something over 40,000 words. Arbitrary, no doubt, but publishers and reviewers of fictional prose tend to call works that fall between 17,500 and 40,000 words a novella. And shorter versions, called novelettes, can be between 7,500 and 17,500 words, while short stories can be anything up to 10,000 words. Articles, because they appear in journals and magazines, do not necessarily fit in any of those categories. And neither do essays or monographs, which are sort of standalone articles about a subject. Now, academic and scholarly works are invariably articles, essays, monographs, or books, and frequently the latter. And that is because the exposition of complex material and complex thoughts cannot easily be reduced to sound bites. Some nuggets can be found in aphorisms, 
and in short poems, where the essence of an idea is beautifully articulated. But regretfully, masters of that type of expression are very few and far between. Poems and poetry have completely different criteria. Although it is interesting that they tend to be gathered in collections that constitute the work or the oeuvre of a single poet or an anthology of poetry, and that such collections qualify as books. The novel is the most common form of fictional book and it has had a tremendous impact on entertainment and on the publishing market. Comic books or graphic novels are books in which the story is illustrated. The characters and narrators use speech or thought bubbles to express verbal language. Reference works such as dictionaries, encyclopedias and databases will inevitably disappear into the electronic realm as the new digital media allows search, retrieval, copying and pasting with ease, speed and precision that defy any human manipulation of a printed codex. And today we are witnessing the last days of the absolute dominance of the codex as the primary receptacle in which the book is stored and read. The digital future is here. But if the codex replaced the scroll without significant loss for anyone, why should we be concerned by the disappearance of the codex in its modern printed form and the appearance of the e-book? I think we should not be concerned. I believe that e-books will replace the printed version of the book. And even those who claim the superiority of the printed version for bed, bath or beach will be overcome by the ability to conjure up a virtual book that will float in the air before our eyes and where we shall be able to turn the pages just by our thoughts or maybe if fancy strikes us to scroll down or laterally across its seamless presentation. Images and video will be equally easy to access and may well be interwoven into the unified multimedia presentation that our reading experiences will become. No, my friends, we should not cry over the demise of the Codex any more than we should cry that great books read for centuries on scrolls began to be read in Codex form. That is progress and it is unstoppable. However, there are some of us a fairly small minority, no doubt, of which I will definitely be one, who shall continue to treasure the Codex book and our book collections. Perhaps some will cherish them as valuable artifacts of a bygone era, as we do first editions today. But for me, it will be because these particular editions that I own marked and dog-eared by multiple readings, have really acquired the status of friends. Not just the voice of the author, mind you, the book itself, the edition with which I spent so much time and which gave me so much enjoyment over the years. The book into which I jotted my marginal comments or underlined a favorite sentence or passage. These will be irreplaceable even as I also delve into the digital world that allows me to carry an entire library of thousands of books in the palm of my hand. So for me, even as I use e-books and all the convenience that electronic search already represents, I join Jefferson and Borges in celebrating the Codex book as my companion and libraries as my personal kind of paradise. I read and reread the classics in all formats because of the qualities that make them classics. Eternally rediscovered by successive generations, these great books in terms of content are the glory of human civilization. 
they repay our investment many times over. And with time, they become my friends, each with its quirks and personality. That wonderful relationship is what would make me apply to them. He eats his famous lines, though he clearly intended it for another context. Think where man's glory most begins and ends, and say, my glory was that I had such friends. Ah, the glory of these great books, past, present, and future great books. So let us agree that the book is not just a receptacle that we have come to know and love as an object. A book is in reality a collection of words that is rather lengthy and that constitutes a certain type of unity as either a work of scholarship or of art or of entertainment. The book has become, through the ages, the standard unit of parsing of knowledge and of those forms of artistic expression that use language as a primary means for communicating their message. Now today, the unit of parsing is changing to become the web page. The texts are searched and retrieved largely as individual sentences or paragraphs, and rarely are these powerful aphorisms in themselves. Now, such sliced and diced material is not necessarily the best way to access cultural output or thoughtful works of profound value. Narrative requires some space and length. The great epics from Gilgamesh to the Iliad are thousands of years old. The great plays are at least as old as ancient Greece. We cherish them to this day as part of that human, oh, all too human legacy we call culture. For in the end, culture is what makes us human. It is what gives us identity and a sense of belonging. We are not only concerned with meeting our basic needs. We want to be free to express ourselves. These expressions define our culture. And the book is the quintessential instrument of culture. It is the work of art that is composed of the words of our language. It uses a triple level of abstraction, the letter, the word, and the sentence. And out of these abstractions come the most powerful images, the greatest ideas, the most profound meditations, and the dreams of what may never be. Our culture is defined by our language, which with its subtleties and its suppleness is at the heart of everything we do. Language is the articulator of ideas. And as Victor Hugo once said, no army can defeat an idea whose time has come. And no less an authority than Napoleon Bonaparte has said, over the long haul, ideas will always defeat the sword. Language is our call to action. It is the invitation to reflect. It constructs mirrors in which we see ourselves and windows through which we see the world. Language can bring to life with passion and pathos historical events long gone with all their joys and all their sorrows. Tears and blood no less real for having been a long time ago. Language can imagine that which never was. Indeed, everything that is was once only imagined by someone. Language can make us speak of, communicate, and comprehend that which we cannot even imagine in our mind's eye. For example, 11-dimensional space, the infinitely small or the infinitely large, the meaning of justice, the importance of truth, the notion of values, the concept of culture, and for true believers, the concept of divinity. Language 
is what brings forth the stuff of dreams. Language is the very substance of culture. Today, our youth are being exposed to more language than any of us could ever imagine. But they tend to get it in short bursts that are necessarily superficial exposures to sometimes profound material. The instruments they use do not encourage them to master exposition and argument. The short SMS, the informal email, the restricted and rapid tweet all make for speed and quantity of communication, but not for quality of language and thoughtful reflection. It is like fast food rather than gourmet cuisine. Now, the issue of language is important. Language changes and lives in the present even as it provides a link to the past. It prefigures the future. It is constantly deconstructed and reconstructed so that new editions of old works are sometimes needed. Now, is the revolution we are witnessing just a faster process of the historical change that pushed the evolution of every language in history? Let me, for purposes of this discussion, limit myself to English, though much of what I say can be mapped onto the histories of other languages and other cultures. Now, the language of Chaucer is very different from that of Shakespeare, and that, in turn, is somewhat different from modern English. But in every generation, every writer learns his or her craft by reading the works of others. Mastery is acquired by exposure and experience, by diligence and craftsmanship. And this is equally true of music or the visual arts. Scholarly works must build on or refute preceding generations. The new is defined in contrast to the established. Innate talents must be nurtured and honed by confrontation with the works of others. That entire growing and cumulative body of works is what creates culture and identity. And today, the power of the internet and the new information and communication technologies has created an atmosphere where young people can and do communicate with each other and with the world of the connectivity and multitasking on a scale that was unbelievable. But I'm concerned that they do not learn to properly manipulate language with its splendor and its awesome power any more than they learn to appreciate the beauty of its constructions and the studied casualness of its ambiguities. Yet these are the skills that interaction with the texts of the past would give, and these are the skills that will enable them to build the masterpieces of tomorrow. Allow me to give some examples of what I fear does not easily come across in the abbreviated slang used in SMS and tweets, or in the short attention spans that are imposed by the rapid tempo and hectic pace of present teenage lifestyles. A lifestyle that makes me recall T.S. Eliot's famous questions posed already a century ago. Where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Language, that greatest of human inventions, can be both supple and subtle. Reading books allows us to learn to appreciate the fine art involved in the manipulation of language and helps budding authors master their craft. In the hands of the masters, language can communicate ideas and feelings within the most minimalist and spare constructions of a Beckett or of a haiku poem. Constructions that can be considered the linguistic match of the spare visual constructions of a Mondrian or a Rothko. But language can go to the other extreme and with a few words give us powerful baroque imagery with rich exuberance of implied detail 
that can roll over us like a wave with an abundance of images. Listen to the powerful opening lines of Shakespeare's Henry V. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene, then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leached in like hounds, should famine, sword, and friar couch for employment. You can almost hear the brass bugles and see the flapping colored flags and standards, all the accoutrement of pomp and magnificence to frame the awesome majesty of the king, the future master of war and glorious conquest. But note the total difference as Shakespeare gives Mark Antony a powerful thunderous voice that brings forth the terrible imagery of war, death, and destruction. Blood and destruction shall be so in use, and dreadful objects so familiar, that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war, all pity choked with the custom of fell deeds. Horrors so unimaginable that only the numbness of familiarity will enable us to endure them. The custom of fell deeds shall choke out even the pity of mothers watching their children die. Cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war that this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrion men groaning for burial. Carrion men groaning for burial. The horrors of the Holocaust the killing fields of the Somme and Verdun in World War I, the wholesale slaughter of World War II, to the massacres of Cambodia, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, and beyond. Only the language of literature can cope with such a challenge. Only the language of literature can allow us to bear witness and marshal our moral outrage and then the immortal phrase of Yeats, O oh, hold in a single thought reality and justice. And I could go on to discuss the meditative voice that can make us understand and take us into the deepest insights of the human condition and so much more. That is what we get from books. They repay our attention and our involvement with insight and gratification. But what about an alternative to the book? Well, in the past century, we invented new art forms, most notably film. It combined visual imagery with dialogue and plot and characterization, along with acting and music. A complex endeavor, the film is the absolute creation of 20th century art. It is a felicitous marriage of technology and art. But the backbone of the film is the screenplay a special form of book. And film too needs some length or substance and effect. The film is not a two minute video clip. Like great novels or plays, it is intentionally constructed in a multi-layered fashion, eschewing a simplistic linearity, developing rounded and complex characters that allow us to see bits of our own reflection in them and to engage with them at different levels in different ways. Powerful as the film is, it will not replace the book. For in the book, by the power of the word, the author invites the readers to create their own mental images. The power of the word is the secret of the book. Words words, words. What are words? Words are symbols for shared memories. The writer can only allude, can only try to make the reader imagine. The reader constructs the rest. And we as readers 
bring to the text our aspirations and our fears, our hopes and our dreams, our concerns and our memories. And a skillful writer is one who opens up possibilities and can leave that creative ambiguity that invites the reader to make his or her contribution. Words can be threatening, seductive, or magical, depending on how they are assembled together and threaded into the tapestry of an essay, a poem, a novel, or a play. In poems, of course, there is meter, rhyme, and poetic imagery. In prose, there are rhetorical devices. But ultimately, there is also the power of the images and metaphors that give words their particular power. For example, these phrases from Chesterton, marble like solid moonlight, or gold like frozen fire. Deceptively simple words can carry profound meanings. Take, for example, these thoughts of Borges reviewing the work of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, a 19th century British son of emigre Italian parents, who is both painter and poet, and who writes in the sonnet Inclusiveness. What man has bent over his son's sleep to brood? How that face shall watch his when cold it lies? Or thought as his own mother kissed his eyes? Of what her kiss was when his father wooed? In the first line, what man has bent over his son's sleep to brood, we have the father bending over the face of the sleeping son. And in the second line, as in a good film, we have the same image reversed. We see the son bending over the face of that dead man, his father. And then Freudian psychology has made us more sensitive to these lines or thought as his own mother kissed his eyes of what her kiss was when his father wooed. Now here we also have the beauty of the soft English vowels in brood and wood, and the additional beauty of wood being by itself, not wood her, but simply wood. The word, says Borges, goes on ringing. Or think of the well-known lines by Robert Frost. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Here we have the same line, repeated word for word, twice over. Yet the sense is different. The first and miles to go before I sleep speaks of physical miles in New England. And sleep means to go and rest and to go to sleep. Now, the second time around, we are made to feel that the miles are not only in space, but in time. And that sleep means to die or to rest the final rest. Two identical lines giving two different and complementary meanings. Beautiful language not necessarily confined to poetry, is seductive by the run of the verse or the flow of the phrase. It is distinctive by its posture in the mouth and in the ear, remarkable for its constant drama of tone and tune. Great books are about great writing, which involves talent, mastery of technique, an unerring sense of drama and insightful understanding of human nature that creates clever, multi-layered narratives and prismatic characters and opens up unending vistas with images that engage our imagination and our intellect. We find and lose ourselves in these creations as each successive generation interacts and reinvents these texts. Toni Morrison chose to tell an allegorical story in her Nobel lecture. It's about an old blind woman who is reputed to be very wise and young teenagers who want to challenge her. And they come asking her whether the bird they are holding is alive or dead. 
Now she's blind. She does not even know if they are holding a bird at all. But her answer is true. It is your responsibility. The exchanges between them show that the bird is language. And it really is in their hands, whether the bird dies or flies. And in the following exchanges, it becomes clear that the bird is not only safe with these youths who challenged her, it will indeed soar. That optimistic parable from one of the all-time greats reminds us that we must not despair, that we leave our precious book in the hands of youth. The book, in terms of the supreme vehicle of that most precious of human gifts, our language, our literature, our heritage, our yesterdays, our tomorrows, will be shaped by that younger generation. And if the challenges we see coming make us fear for all we love, we should know that this is nothing new. A poet once said of the next generation, I see no hope for the future of our people if they are dependent on the frivolous youth of today, for certainly all youth are reckless beyond words and impatient of restraint. It was Hesiod, the father of Greek didactic poetry, and the year was 700 BC. Uh -huh. I, like Toni Morrison, trust our youth. Indeed, I prefer to think of them in this rapidly changing world as the great Robert Frost already thought of them half a century ago when he said, now I am old, my teachers are the young. What can't be molded must be cracked and sprung. I strain at lessons fit to start a suture. I go to school to youth to learn the future. So my end is my beginning. The book will survive, not as an artifact of bound leaves between two covers, but as a collection of words of some length, of unimaginable variety and power. Doubtless, it will take different shapes that we cannot even imagine, but it will be suited to worlds we cannot even imagine. Let us trust youth. They too will need language. They will create the books of tomorrow for their world, part virtual and part real. They will find the ways that suit their times as we have found the ways that suited ours. Thus, will they also rediscover the great classics, as every generation does, for it is that that makes them classics, that they are the touchstones of our memories and the wellsprings of our imagination. And the youth of today will also produce their own great works that will become classics for the generations that will come after them. And the book lives on and on and on.